so well. So yes, welcome to our uh, uh, Australian Indonesian glaucoma lecture series. Today, we will have a very interesting topic of um, glaucoma surgery assessment. And I think um, our session will be led by Dr. Geoffrey Chan, who will give an, uh, uh, a lecture, uh, but uh, the presentation will be incorporated together with Dr. Irma's uh, case discussion. So uh, the presentation will be from both, um, would be interesting. So please, Dr. Geoffrey Chan, you would like to start? Perfect, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, so the topic today is all about post-glaucoma surgery assessment. Okay, so we're going to cover a few different things in amongst this. We're going to focus on, of course, the post-operative assessment at the slit lamp and what are the important features to look out for from the glaucoma perspective. We'll talk about defining criteria for success and criteria for failure of our glaucoma surgeries we do. Um, what's the recommended timing of follow-up for our patients surgery-wise and, of course, monitoring progression after surgical interventions. So. We've got Dr. Irma, who will be giving the case presentations. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the supervisor that gave me the opportunity today. My name is Irma, an ophthalmology resident from Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia. I'm here today to present cases regarding to post glaucoma surgery assessment. Uh, the first case is a 40 years old woman came to glaucoma outpatient clinic with chief complaint, blur vision of left eye, especially on temporal sites since three months ago. The complaint was accompanied by red eye, headache, and also nausea. The patient said that the, the red eye had progressive tunnel vision and completely blurred in the mid of 20, 2000 and 2020. There were no history of systemic diseases, and the patient already had medication for glaucoma from Trevisius Hospital. There were timolol, latinoprost, sprinzolamide, and also bermonidine. There was no history of glaucoma in the family. Next. From ophthalmological examinations, as we can see here on the table, the visual acuity of the right eye was hand movement with good projections, and the left eye was 6 over 8.5 bit corrections. Both of IOP was normal with different kind of type of glaucoma and anti-glaucoma medications, and the entire chamber was deep, the lens was clear, and from fundoscopic examination, the optic nerve disc of the red eye range between 0 0.7 until 0 0.8, and the left eye range between 0 0.5 until 0 0.6. Next. The gynoscopic examination revealed an open angle in both eyes. Next. We discover on OCT examinations that next, next, the red the red eye seems relatively thin on retinal nerve fiber layer, especially in the inferior part, temporal and superior parts, and in the left eye it tends to relative, relatively thin in the inferior parts. Next. On visual field examination, the examination of the red eye was unreadable. The left eye appeared to have a moderate visual field defect with risk. The patient was unable to fully concentrate on examinations. Next. Those examinations lead us to diagnose this patient with primary open angle glaucoma and was continued with four kinds of anti-glaucoma medications and it was decided to perform trabeculectomy with 5 FU of the left eye under local anesthesia. Following the surgery, the patient was given antibiotic and anti-inflammation topical medications as well on, as ongoing anti-glaucoma medication for the red eye. Next. On post-operative day one, next. The visual acuity was 6 over 60 and the IOP was, was 16 without any glaucoma medications. On conjunctiva, as we can see here in the picture, the subconjunctival hemorrhage was positive, the heat of the lip was medium, diffuse had mild vascularity, and the eredectomy peripher at 12 o'clock was good. Next. On postoperative day 7, the patient had a normal IOP without any medications. Unfortunately, we found the sclera exposed with positive serial tests. 
As a result of this finding, we decided to administer a bandage contact lens, which will be evaluated in one week. Next, we found a negative serial test one week after the follow-up evaluation. However, the square remained exposed, so we, we stopped the prednisolone acetat and performed restoring of the blood in the operating room. Next. Next. On the follow-up day after blood suturing, the blood morphology was good in terms of height, shape, and coverage, and the serial test was negative. Next. Reversible suture was planned to be removed in one week. Next. After removal of the reversible suture, the IOP was still 20 mm mercury. Therefore, we added timolol and latinopros for the left eye. Next. In the most recent follow-up, next, the IOP was successfully managed by medications, the blood morphology was good, and the enteric chamber was deep. The toy elimination showed the patency of peripheral erythectomy, but the lens began to become hazy. As a conclusion, we diagnosed these patients with primary open angle glaucoma uh, after trabecoitin surgery, and sonal cataract of the left eye, and we plan to continue the medications and evaluate the visual field examination on the next follow-up visit. This brings us to the end of my first case. Now we shall proceed to Dr. Jeffrey, who will talk about the blood assessment. Great, so that was a really nice example of essentially a post-operative blood leak, which required revision in theater. So tracking back to our clinical assessment, uh, really the question is what are the things that we're looking for on day one? So of course we wanna focus on the vision as we saw from Dr. Irma there. Pressure is always one of the big things we wanna know. Lens status, so in terms of the, um, just keeping in mind whether the patient's pseudophagic or not, as well as the anterior chamber depth, any inflammation or high femur, which uh, is essentially pro-inflammatory in the pro post-operative state. And of course, we want to really take a look at examining the bleb. So that's looking at things like bleb height, closure of the wounds, any subconjunctival blood within that bleb. Um, and a big thing is bleb transparency and the presence of microcysts. So just to show you that there, and this is what I show all the registrars that, that come by and do clinic with me, what you want to do is have a high bright beam, shine it on an angle on the, on the bleb, and what you'll see are the presence of these microcysts, which in a functional trabeculectomy represent extra fluid in the extracellular space. And that's always signs of a good, well-functioning bleb. You wanna do a, you wanna put some fluorazine on the eye to do a sidal test to make sure that your wounds are nicely sealed. And of course you do wanna assess the patient's fundus, especially in the early post-operative assessments to make sure there's no signs of choroidal effusion or signs of the eye being too soft. So this brings us on to um, some of the algorithms that I get all the uh, registrars that do clinic with me to uh, memorize or familiarize themselves with. Um, the big thing when you're looking at a patient who's had trabeculectomy surgery or glaucoma surgery is the intraocular pressure. And really, when you're looking at that IOP, you're either thinking that the patient's on target and you're happy with that pressure or not. If the pressure is too low, you can work your way down the algorithm and so in a patient with a low pressure, let's say the pressure is four after surgery, really what you want to look at is examine the bleb or the bleb elevation or the bleb height. And if the bleb isn't there, then really you want to get some fluorazine on the eye to assess for something like a bleb leak. You can always think of things like ciliary body shutdown or the presence of choroidal effusions, which result in low pressures. Now, if your pressure is low and there is a bleb in the eye, then really what you're thinking of is an over filtering bleb. So that's when you haven't tightened your stitches enough and there's too much fluid draining out of the eye. Uh, conversely, if you're seeing a patient postoperatively and their pressure is a little bit too high, then once again, you wanna look at the bleb. Now, if there's no bleb there, so if the bleb is low or absent, then really you wanna get your gonioscopy lens on because what you wanna be examining is the sclerostomy for any signs of obstruction. So iris, stopping the fluid from getting out of the eye. And you also think of things like tight flap switches as well as flap fibrosis. 
when the pressure is high and there is a bleb there, then the next thing you should really look at is the anterior chamber depth for the patient. And if the AC is shallow, as we'll see later, you're thinking of things like suprachoroidal hemorrhage or malignant glaucoma, otherwise known as aqueous misdirection. Or if the anterior chamber is deep in the eye, then really what you're thinking of is localized uh, you know, resistance to outflow. So that's things like tenon cyst or a more typical failing bleb. Okay, so those are the kind of things that you want to look for. And at the end of the day, we're, we're giving a whole talk about, you know, clinical examination and glaucoma assessment after surgery. So why bother assessing a bleb? Well, uh, the reason is that, especially in those first 12 post-operative weeks, bleb assessment is critical, okay? So what you're going to do is when you're looking at a bleb, you're going to identify what are the favorable and unfavorable characteristics of bleb development. And that's going to let you estimate outcomes for the patients, identify any early signs of failure for your surgery so that you can actually do some intervention and also look out for complications of surgery. So in this photo here, this is a patient with a really uh, aggressively failing, kind of typical failing bleb. You see that they're highly vascularized. There's some avascularity around the limbus. And really, uh, early and aggressive intervention is warranted in these cases. Um, you really want to catch them before the bleb scars down and fails altogether. And, and really, I, you know, what I always say is that as glaucoma surgeons, we are really conjunctival and, and masters of healing because healing is the enemy. And that's what I tell all our patients, right? So when it comes to the wound healing, we know there are patient risk factors to consider those patients that have had previous surgery, uveitis, neovascular glaucoma. And we know that when we create that glaucoma filtration surgery, you get a rush of things like red blood cells, fibrin and activated cytokines, as you can see in panel C there, that flow out from the aqueous underneath our flap and into our bleb site, which basically activates the fibroblasts uh, which then stimulate myofibroblast transdifferentiation and eventual surgical failure due to scarring of that bleb. Okay, so this is basically what we don't want, right? And, and, and we know that if we're really good at examining our blebs postoperatively, well, there are early options to modify that pressure and to modify the natural progression of that, of that bleb and how it wants to heal. So easy things that we can do, and, and that's not the focus of my talk, but things like bleb massage, early on to encourage fluid to flow out underneath the scleral flap. Um, you can talk about pulling releasables, doing laser sutilysis. And in that photograph there, we can see the Hoskins laser sutilysis lens, which we use at Fremantle Hospital. Basically, you can use the argon laser and punch a little hole through one of your um, stitches if you don't do releasables. You can think about giving the patient uh, post-operative injections of 5-fluorouracil, dexamethasone, or anti-VEGF. And also you can think about adjusting how much steroid the patient is putting in their eye. As we saw in Dr. Irma's case before, uh, with the bleb leak, you know, they were really cutting back on the steroids early mm -hmm. on to encourage scarring in this instance. Mm -hmm. um, what you can do is you can think about needling of the bleb, introduction of glaucoma medication, or even reoperation if the pressure starts to climb up. So there are basically things that we can identify and do to modify the outcome. Okay. And in terms of the bleb assessment, these are the things that you, you want to look at over time. Um, and really, you want to train yourself to be systematic in how you examine a patient's bleb in clinic. Um, there are different grading systems available. This is kind of one of the better known ones amongst us glaucoma surgeons. It's the Moorfields Bleb Grading System, also known as the MBGS. And working through what we're looking at in terms of the health of a bleb, they actually divide it into the diffusion area. So over here in the box, you can see that that's divided into a central bleb area, which is the bleb or the center of the bleb amongst the superior conjunctiva. And there's also a maximal diffusion area. And that's graded between one, two, three, four, and five, with basically five representing a larger diffusion area, larger being better or lower uh, being related to lower intraocular pressures. You can actually look at grading the height of the bleb. So over there, we see that there's grade one to four. And here are standard photographs that Moorfields have provided where you can reference that in, in, relation, to, in relation to the patient's bleb height. 
Um, and lastly, and perhaps most importantly, you, you've got the um, vascularity of the bleb. And that's basically where we look at zero being an acystic bleb up the top and working our way to a normal conjunctiva, mild, moderate, and very severe vascularity below, uh, which is basically the biggest risk factor or biggest kind of prognostic indicator of how, how a bleb's doing and how much fibrosis is happening underneath that flap. And so what we do is there are, you, you should be aware that there are other grading scales available. Here's another widely accepted uh, one that the Americans like to use. That's the Indiana bleb uh, appearing grading scale. And what you'll see is that once again, they talk about bleb height, bleb uh, extent, this time graded in terms of clock hours of how far the bleb spreads, vascularity of the bleb, as we mentioned before. And in addition, they actually add in a sidal test with S0 being no leak, S1 being multiple pinpoint leaks, and S2 being a very profuse leak. And, and of course, we, we get fancy over time. As, as ophthalmologists, we all like our toys. So, um, you know, there, there certainly have been studies looking at anterior segment OCT and uh, its ability to uh, evaluate the functioning bleb. And, and really, th there is a role here. Um, you know, studies are still being done, but, but you know, almost uh, ubiquitously, they, they, we find that a low reflectivity wall and the presence of episcleral fluid uh, is uh, associated with lower intraocular pressure outcomes. Here's a patient that I did a presaflow micro shunt in. And as you can see, as we're scrolling through the stack, you're seeing that there are basically these clefts of fluid uh, running around in lamellas in that subconjunctival space. And, and that really represents a, a good bleb with, with a pressure of 10 in this instance. Okay. Um, we also get a little bit fancy. We actually look at, um, people have actually looked at using OCT angiography as well to assess the blebs post-operatively. And uh, in this group, uh, in this Korean group, what they actually did was they actually looked at, uh, uh, you know, looking at OCTA of the bleb and correlating that between the Moorfields bleb grading as well as the Indiana grading scale. And, and what they did find was a significant positive correlation. You can see up the top in box A, that's an avascular bleb. OCTA shows that it's avascular. And using custom software, they can actually generate heat maps based on density of the vascularity. And basically, they showed very good correlations there. But at the end of the day, it's really correlating what we're seeing at the slit lamp uh, based with structure or underlying structure uh, of what's happening underneath that bleb. Okay. So... Uh, Dr. Irma presented really nicely about that leaking bleb. Um, well, really, what you want to do is you want to use 2% fluorazine. So I tell my registrars, don't use that dilute fluorazine that contains lignocaine. What you want is really strong fluorazine, either the strips or just 2%, and you want to flood that eye. And really, you want to put that drop right over the bleb to see whether it's leaking or not. Here we have a case of, actually, this was a pinpoint leaking bleb um, referred to me many years down the track. And you can actually see the area where it's particularly thin focally uh, along that bleb there. And over here, um, it was actively leaking when this patient was initially seen, uh, but luckily with a large bandage contact lens and the, and the use of some supplemental timolol eye drops to reduce aqueous flow, um, you know, I was quite satisfied that at least at the moment that that pinpoint leak had stopped. But you can really sometimes see that, that little ooze and you, you really want to use that concentrated fluorazine. Now, in contrast, when you're using your fluorazine, sometimes you see patients like this. So if anyone calls me over and I, and, I, and, I, and I examine the patient and I'm seeing this at the slit lamp, well, you don't really need to check the patient's pressure. You already know that there's going to be hypotony here. And so over here, you guys can actually see that in the patient's cornea, there are multiple striae that the fluorazine is highlighting. And, and what this clinical sign is called is uh, Bowman folds. And basically, if you're seeing that, as in this patient, you know that there's going to be some reason for, you know there's going to be clinical hypotony. So here you can already see that there's a bit of aqueous leaking from that bleb edge. And when I put the 2% fluorazine, well, you can really see that diffuse leak at the limbus with the aqueous basically diluting the fluorazine around it. Okay, so once again, 2% fluorazine, don't use the diluted stuff, and you really want to put it straight over that bleb site. Okay, and, and of course, as I, as I mentioned before, you, you want to be checking these patients' fundus because you want to make sure that they, they, they don't have you know, any clinical signs of hypotony, be it subtle choroidal folds or be it large 
uh, choroidal effusions, as we see in this case. Okay, just a quick note on tubes, and because it is a post-glaucoma surgery assessment talk, um, but, but really, uh, Dr. Irma and I are going to limit it to uh, trabeculectomy, otherwise we'll be here for hours. But I guess for the registrars in the group, just a quick note on tubes when you're doing your clinical examination. What you want to do is you want to look at the glaucoma drainage device. You want to see where the plate's sitting and you want to see the position of the tube. So in which quadrant is the tube sitting? How many tubes are there? Sometimes there are multiple. Um, and is the tube being placed in the anterior chamber, the sulcus plane or the pars planar? You can see that in this patient was referred to me with neovascular glaucoma. Um, she was pseudophagic. And in my pseudophagics, I always opt to put the tube in the sulcus plane. Um, I often dilate them on the table. Um, and that way through a dilated pupil, I like to see just the edge of my tube so that I can actually dilate them in clinic and examine them postoperatively. You want to be looking at the patient's patch graft and making sure that's covering over the tube and that there's no erosion. There's something called a ripcord for the registrars out there. And that's basically where you can actually put a stent or an intraluminal stent inside the tube to stop the tube from flowing out so much, especially early on. And of course, we always examine the bleb. Um, to be honest, you wanna look beyond the ridge of the plate when it comes to examining the bleb associated with a glaucoma drainage device. Um, and, and realistically, a lot of the times you can't see that bleb. Um, so the drainage status of the tube is often inferred from the pressure outcome of the patient. So that same patient, again, with neovascular glaucoma, you can see that once I dilate the patient um, in the clinic, you can really see the um, sulcus bar belt tube that I've inserted in there in the immediate post-operative setting. In the top right, we can see the scleral patch graph that's covered and, and basically sits on top of that tube to stop erosion. And down the bottom of the eye in the bottom right, you can actually see that uh, you know, in Australia, I actually use a 30 nylon suture to place inside a barbell tube. And, and really that stops too much fluid from, from running out, out of after that tube. And I, and I use that in combination with um, bicro dissolving stitches. Um, and basically that's another guard against hypotony. Um, okay, so specific things to look out for with a tube when it comes to complications. Is the tube blocked or attracted over time? You know, is the tube or plate eroded or exposed over time? And in this instance, we can see a patient that was referred to me with a exposed glaucoma drainage device. You can tell that's been there for a while because they've actually conjunctivalized underneath that. And uh, also, you're also looking for any endothelial decompensation. This you know there's an arc. And so ubiquitously after 10 years, all these patients end up with some form of endothelial dysfunction. And so you can see in this patient with uh, really bad chronic uveitis, multiple tube surgeries, you can see that the, the endothelium isn't functioning so well and, and their cornea is quite cloudy. Okay, and that's where the tube is. Um, and that brings us on to our second case that Dr. Irma is going to present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey, for the explanation regarding lip assessment and also the algorithm. Now, I'll present the next case. A 60 years old man had blurred vision in his right eye for six months. The complaint was accompanied by foggy vision, weary feelings, and watery eyes. Since a year ago, the left eye has unable, us also unable to see. There was no historic of systemic diseases. The reason medication that he had was time alone two times a day for both eyes. Next. And for the ophthalmology examinations, as we can see here, with the correction, the red eye's visual acuity was 6 over 30, while the left eye had hand movement wrong projections. The IUP of the right eye was higher than left eye, the anterior chamber was deep, and both of his eyes had mid-dilated pupil with minimum light reflex. Both lenses were hazy. In both eyes, the optic nerve disc range between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9. Next, the kinescopy examinations reveal an open angle, glaucom, uh, open angle in both eyes. Next, on the OCT examinations, I'd like to you to notice that there was a positive sign of floor effect from the OCT that indicated the advanced stage of glaucoma. We discover a severe visual field defect in harmful right eye through, through an examinations. Next. 
As a consequence, we diagnosed this patient with advanced primary open angle glaucoma and snail cataract in both eyes. We chose a combination of topical and oral anti-glaucoma medications and follow up this patient in two weeks. Two weeks later, the facial acuity decreased from 3 over 60 to 1 over 60 after two weeks of medications. And the IUP was 19 millimeter mercury with medications. The other part remained unchanged from the previous one and led us to perform focal emulsification and intraocular lens in the right eye and restore the visual acuity with retinometry. And the result of retinometry was 6 over 12. Next. Following surgery, the visual acuity remained unchanged from day one to day seven. However, the IUP of both eyes was reduced with glaucoma medications. On 14, 14 day after cataract surgery, the IUP of the left eye was higher, which was 30 millimeter mercury with medications. So we decided to perform trabeculectomy with five FU injections to the left eye. Next. One day after surgery, the IUP remained high. We performed digital ocular massage and the IUP decreased to 14 millimeter mercury. The blade morphology was normal. The entire, the entire chamber was deep with good patency of aridectomy at 11 o'clock. And we continued the medications. 14 days after trabeculectomy, as we can see here on the table, the IUP was 23 millimeter mercury and the releasable suture had not yet released. The next step, we remove the releasable suture yet in the IUP hang in 20 millimeter mercury. That's the reason we added the glaucoma medication which time all two times a day to the left eye. Next. Um, one day after the surgery, the IP remained he high. The, the IP remained high. We performed digital core massage and the IP decreased to 14. Um, I'm sorry, next. Um, yeah. After three weeks after surgery, the IP was high even after we gave massage to the left eye. The blip height was low with medium vascularity. And the entire chamber was deep with good in uh, with good iridectomy morphology, and the lens was hazy. We decided to perform needling and five FU injections. Next, after the needling, the IP was twenty three millimeter mercury and lower to seventy after massage. The blip morphology had medium heat, diffuse characteristic, and good vascularity. The entire chamber was deep and the iridectomy was good. And we kept the medications going and instructed the patient to get regular massage for the left eye. Next. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tatema. So yeah, that was that was a great case that just demonstrated how aggressively some patients can essentially fibrose or, or scar after surgery. That's that's a patient that really needed kind of early, early needling and post-operative intervention to, to keep their trauma going. So, so basically we can talk about complications of trabeculectomy and, and these are the things that you're looking for in every, every subsequent assessment. Um, we've kind of covered some of the early complications that you can see after surgery. Um, and, and really over time or in the longer term, what you wanna be looking at is, is those later complications. So just to focus on that, those are the things like progression of cataract, um, you know, infection. So that's blebitis or endophthalmitis after surgery, uh, bleb migration over time, bleb dysesthesia. So that's when the patient's, you know, basically symptomatic of their bleb and, and unhappy with how it feels. Um, over time, the blebs can actually go the other way. And instead of scarring up and pressure going up, we can find that some blebs actually start to cause hypotony. And that can also be related to, related to leakage or failure of the filtering bleb over time. And so I think Dr. M is gonna make some comments. Yeah, these are the picture as an example of early and late complication after the surgery. We can see the wet on red appearance as a sign of acute blebitis. And this is an example of cystic bleb. 
And the last picture is an example of shallow inner chamber with high IOP because of acute misdirection that will lead to malignant glaucoma. I will turn over to Dr. Jeffrey. We will go over the intervention to alter the progression in greater detail. Great. So, you know, the post-operative complications with trabeculectomy are abundant. And anyone who's been doing it, you know, for long enough, I'm sure has seen the whole gamut of, of what can happen and, and what we look for in our patients every time they come. You know, all, all, all the patients need to know that, especially with their glaucoma and especially after surgery, that, that they really should be seen post-operatively, um, you know, and even if they're stable over time, because, because essentially complications can end up uh, coming on late in the, in the disease illness. In the top left photo there, or in the left photo, we, we see a decented bleb, um, which, you know, as you can see, it's high riding. As the patient's blinks, it, it can annoy the patient. And, and so that, that would be causing some element of bleb dysesthesia. In the middle patient, you can see how this patient's reacted um, to, to some mitomycin C. And that's really a really large cystic avascular bleb at the limbus. Um, and so... Uh, what you can, um, I mean, what you want to do is, is intraoperatively, at least, you really want to minimize disturbance and mitomycin C contacting the edge of that conjunctival peritomy that you've made um, and making sure that the mitomycin C goes, goes posteriorly to avoid that kind of appearance. And in the right there, you can see that over time, you, you can get things like melt of the scleral flap. In this case, you can see the patient with very thin um, sclera there, you can see basically uveal prolapse starting to show um, superiorly from where that scleral flap was made from a pre-existing trabeculectomy. So, so complications are rife. All right, so we're just going to change track a little bit. And because this talk is about uh, assessment after glaucoma surgery. And um, so, so one of those things that we have to be aware of are, are what do we actually define as our criteria for success, that we can pat ourselves on the back and say that we've done good surgery. Well, you know, we should be aware that there are various possible definitions of success. And really, you've got to think about what you want to achieve with each patient before you actually undertake that surgery. And so in terms of glaucoma success, you can talk about absolute pressure reductions. Um, so, you know, I want to get this patient to a pressure of 12 after surgery. You can talk about percentage reductions. Um, in terms of success. And there are also formula-based values that take into account things like severity of the patient's mean deviation um, and, and certain outcomes related to that um, to talk about success. And of course, there's the concept of complete success. So that's getting the patient to a certain pressure or outcome without the use of any medications uh, versus qualified success. So that's typically when you actually do your glaucoma surgery, and then they end up on a few eye drops after that uh, to get them to a certain pressure. Okay, so the World Glaucoma Association has an entire book about this. Um, you know, I encourage you guys to read some of the WGA guidelines, um, which are basically consensus statements. Um, and really, they've got guidelines on the design and reporting of glaucoma surgical trials. Our colleagues have done that for us. And at least in terms of the WGA criteria, well, they talk about glaucoma surgery success um, and after trabeculectomy success being a pressure that lands between six and less than 21 millimeters of mercury in combination with a more than 20% reduction in pressure from baseline. And that's got to be consistently measured on two consecutive follow-ups anytime after month three from surgery. So three months and beyond. And once again, you can talk about complete success. So that's achieving that target without any glaucoma medications versus qualified success where you use medications to get you to that outcome. Okay. And, and really it's all about that target intraocular pressure. Um, you know, once again, every patient that I operate on, I, I've always, you know, you should assess the disc, you should assess their visual fields. And based on the evidence, we know, and, and the patient's own baseline starting intraocular pressure, you, you should have in your mind what kind of pressure you'd like to achieve with, with some of the patients that you operate on. So we've got basically guidelines from the Collaborative Initial Glaucoma Treatment Study, as well as the European Glaucoma Society. And basically, they've got various sliding scales of what you, you know, should aim to achieve based on the severity of visual field damage. Um, in terms of a percentage term, well, in red there, we see that patients with mild glaucoma 
um, you know, really you want to aim at least initially for a 20% pressure reduction with a pressure less than 21. In those with moderate glaucoma, you got to be stronger. You're aiming for 30% pressure reduction and a pressure, absolute pressure less than 18. And in advanced damage, well, really you want to keep the pressure less than 15. Um, for some of us with more aggressive intraocular pressure targets, you know, we like to hit something like 12. Uh, and really you want a good 40% reduction in these patients. And, and there are numerous studies that have been done about target intraocular pressures. Simplified targets are available. Um, so for the registrars out there, you know, generally anyone who does clinic with me knows that I'm quite aggressive and, and I'm really looking for less than 12 millimeters of mercury for, for patients with advanced or end-stage disease. Okay, so something to be in mind or something to keep in mind though is that basically you can have a patient with a starting pressure of 18 before surgery but they're on all the eye drops, you know, known to men. Um, and basically you can do surgery on them and then pressure ends up 15 without medications. Um, the pr problem there is that based on the WGA criteria, this surgery is gonna be classified as a failure because they haven't reached that 20% reduction. Okay, so, so keep in mind that, you know, we can, even though it's classified as a failure, it can be quite a successful clinical outcome for the patients. So you've really got to, got to look through that and, and just kind of take that with a grain of salt. Um, now, there are follow-up schedules that are recommended for patients having glaucoma surgery. Always, um, you know, before I do glaucoma surgery on a patient, I'll tell them that I'll always need to see them the first day after the surgery. Um, and then really, I, 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 under promise and over deliver. So I say, you and I are gonna be seeing each other every week for the first month after surgery. And so really it's a bonus uh, when they don't have to see me because I'll see them on day one, I'll see them on week one. And depending on week one, if they're traveling really well, sometimes I'll see them, I'll give them a two week break and, and see them either you know at the three week post-operative period or even the one month post-operative period. Okay, but, but really you've got to do intensive and individualized post-operative care for every single one of these patients, okay? And it also depends on uh, the patient and the actual procedure that you're doing um, with trabeculectomy realistically being a very high post-operative care type surgery, okay? So I think just to finish off, uh, I really condensed this case. Um, really just to show you guys, this is a 57 year old male um, who was phakic, so he's actually very young, um, not much cataract there, but he did have bilateral primary angle closure glaucoma, uh, more advanced than his left compared to his right eye, um, ended up doing a trabeculectomy for this gentleman, ended up with a very nice diffuse post-operative uh, bleb um, underlying the scleral flap. And really, I bring this case up because um, it was very interesting. I actually did his surgery earlier in the year in the, uh, in the more advanced left eye, um, and then I actually followed up with surgery in the right. And both times after surgery, the patient said, doc, I feel like my vision's definitely improved. And, and that was really interesting because if you actually see his visual fields uh, kind of before the surgery in his left eye compared to after the surgery, well, you could be convinced there that, that there are visual field improvements. And, and this was really quite consistent with the patient um, and, and his improvement after surgery compared to before once we lowered his intraocular pressures. And in his other eye, it was a, a very similar picture, a very similar picture indeed. Okay, so over here, we can see that, you know, his most recent eye surgery I did was, was, was you know, at the uh, end of July. And, and, and really, you know, the patients ended up with, with you know, at least cleaner looking fields on, on the pattern deviation scans. Okay, so there lies in your, your, your first take home after, from this talk. And that's that visual fields can improve after surgery. Um, we know that that's well described in the literature. Um, and so uh, this group kind of Chua et al um, in a more recent paper published in 2020, well, they actually looked at one year structural and functional changes after trabeculectomy. And over here, you can see that they did surgery on these patients and they basically repeated a visual field test at three month intervals after surgery. And there was quite a reproducible uh, increase in the visual field mean deviation from baseline to the three month post-operative visit of 2.55 uh, decibels. And, and so for these 100 patients, they actually found that in the first three months, well, actually a lot of the patients improved the visual fields before plateauing and then declining over the subsequent nine months after surgery. 
and you can see the slopes of the decibels per year there. And the predictors of further visual field deterioration in their cohort of patients were eyes that lacked an initial improvement in visual field, um, any retinal nerve layer thinning that continued after surgery, increasing intraocular pressure, suggesting kind of, you know, fibrosis and reduced efficiency of that trabeculectomy after surgery, as well as those with a bad or severe glaucoma at baseline. So those are the people that tend to not do so well and, and to have further deterioration in their fields. Um, you know, but once again, I, I think we can pat ourselves on the back for this because trabeculectomy can improve long-term visual functions for our patient. And so um, Caprioli um, et al. published this, um, you know, study of 74 eyes, and that was actually um, compared with a control group as well. But they basically went through their data over a 10-year period or so and looked at the patient's visual fields five years before surgery and about five years after surgery. And what they did find was that certainly the, the mean rate of change for all the visual field locations slowed down. And so they actually had a cohort of relatively fast progressors. And so they had a cohort of about minus 2.5 decibels a year prior to surgery. And they, they really slowed down that visual field uh, reduction to about a slope of minus 0 0.10 per year after surgery. And that was significant. So they basically showed that, you know, trabeculectomy is the gold standard still, and it does slow the rate of parametric decay. And basically this study provided evidence of kind of sustained and long-term improvements of visual function for our patients with glaucoma. Um, just a little note on snuff out. And, and of course, this is, this is when you get referred those very advanced end-stage patients, similar to the ones that, that Irma presented to you earlier. And, and these are really patients with very advanced glaucoma with very uh, residual neuroretinal rim remaining. Um, and, 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 you know, the term for that, so after you do surgery, some of these patients can end up with permanent and severe vision loss. And, and the thought there is that it's the phenomenon called snuff out, also known as wipeout. Okay. So in this study of 301 eyes that underwent trabeculectomy, um, and these were patients with advanced glaucoma followed up for two year periods, they found that 2% of their cohort ended up with permanent and severe vision loss after surgery with no identifiable cause, okay? So, so the concept there is that you can actually wipe out the patient's remaining uh, axons by, by putting the eye through the stress of surgery. And there are kind of significant risk factors that are known that can predict who might be at increased risk of developing this complication. And those are the patients with uh, what's called preoperative split fixation. And so, you know, the variation there um, kind of varies, but uh, the definition there varies, but that's basically patients where there's either a zero to minus 10 decibel loss in any one quadrant of the visual fields that's involving central fixation. Um, you know, patients with uh, increased number of quadrants of vision loss um, and also patients that have a bit of a rocky journey after their surgery who typically develop transient choroidal effusions, they were also at increased risk of having permanent vision loss after surgery as well. And so what happens to retinal nerve fiber layer thickness after glaucoma surgery? Well, in that same study by Chua, it was perhaps less promising. Um, in their cohort, at least, least with kind of modern spectralist techniques, they actually showed that the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness continued to reduce by about minus four microns a year um, any time from the first month of follow-up. And once again, the, the things that were going to predict the patients that had continued RNFL decline were those with significant visual field deterioration, increasing pressure, or moderate or severe glaucoma. And, and really, you know, it depends on what study you look at. There are certain studies especially the older ones that uh, really report that retinal nerve fiber layer actually increases after glaucoma surgery um, and then tends to revert to its preoperative values at around three months after surgery. And, and just a little note here that that's glaucoma progression after surgery. Well, how do we do? Um, we know that one third of eyes, so about 28%, even after we do our trabeculectomy, at the five-year point, about one third of our patients are gonna show continued progression for whatever reason, okay? And in this study, they showed that 
Um, there was some progression of glaucoma based on trend-based analysis of visual field or optic nerve head change. Uh, but luckily, only 6% of their patients had continued glaucoma progression uh, when it came to a matching visual field deficit that correlated with anatomy. And who's going to get worse uh, glaucoma after surgery? Well, any progression was predicted by those with higher pressure after surgery, um, with progressors having a pressure more than 15 millimeters of mercury in their cohort, as well as a lower drop of pressure uh, from baseline, where in their cohort, 30% uh, um, drop wasn't enough to keep the, the, the glaucoma stable. And so Dr. Irma is going to talk to you about basically what happens to the uh, refractive status after cataract, uh, after trabeculectomy. Okay. Uh, okay, then I will go on to highlight why I see as the main points of cataract progression after trabeculectomy surgery. According to the new study from Iwasaki et al., who evaluated the refractive changes in the patients who underwent trabeculectomy as the primary outcome, the secondary outcome were postoperative complications and prognosis factor for refractive change. I'd like to direct your attention to this table. Next. This table shows the progressive refractive changes after trabeculectomy surgery, especially in the phacic eyes, until a year after surgery. And from their multifarad analysis, they show the lens nuclear color grid with a significant prognosis factor for refractive myopia progression with a statistically significant result. Next. Um, the reason for cataract progression after trabeculectomy remains unknown. However, some study had the evidence of cataract progression after the surgery found that eyes with trabeculectomy have a higher risk of cataract progression compared with those with non-penetrating surgery. Next. There was also a review that conducted by Rasmi et al. who found the possible mechanism related cataract progression to glaucoma and trabeculectomy surgery. First, Hypotony, the lens to coronal contacts due to anterior chambers showing causes the cataract progression. Secondly, other possible mechanism for cataract progression after trabeculectomy included include a reduction in aqueous humor production, which may reduce nutrient delivery to the lens due to anterior chamber showing. Thirdly, mitomycin C was responsible to have toxic material for the lens epithelium and the lens. The acute humor flow change was become the possible mechanism with the peripheral erydectomy. This brings us to the end of this topic. So I will turn over to Dr. Jeffrey. And I think that that brings us to the end of the talk as well. Um, so, you know, that was our talk on glaucoma surgery and assessment after you do that surgery. So take home points. Post, hopefully we've, we've both convinced you that post-operative assessment is critical. Um, you wanna be actively looking out and thinking about complications um, with the surgery. Um, we've talked today about definitions of success um, after glaucoma surgery. Um, and I would encourage you guys to really set a target intraocular pressure for your patients before doing surgery um, so that you, you can think about what you wanna achieve. Um, We've shown that trabeculectomy can itself improve long-term visual outcomes in our patients with, with glaucoma. And unfortunately, there will be a cohort of eyes that will still continue to progress despite our best efforts. And that brings us pretty good time, 8.53. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeffrey and Dr. Irma. Uh, very uh, insightful presentation and very, um, how do you say we're very uh, intrigued to ask questions as, as shown here. Some already asked questions in the chat box. May I go through one by one, yeah? Um, Dr. Irma is, Dr. Mita is asking about the administration of post-op steroids in black leak condition. Do you recommend to reduce the dosage of steroid in cases of leaking blood while giving the bandage contact lens or planning a resuture? Or uh, if so, will it affect the future longevity of the blood if you change the dosage of the steroids? What do you think? Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, so long story short, yes, it really, it tracks back to um, how much the bleb is leaking. Okay, so if you see a really diffuse leak, like the one that I showed you with clinical signs of, of hypotony, you know that you can't sit on these patients. So, so in those instances, I won't play around with a steroid. I know that I need to take the patient back to theater, okay? Because they are gonna need a resuture um, and you're gonna have to revise that, that bleb. Um, but in the cases where there's just a little bit of a leak or there's a little bit of a leak at the edges, then, then yes, what I'll typically do is use a, um, you know, a large diameter bandage contact lens, and then I will reduce the steroid. Um, I'm quite aggressive with my post-operative steroid regime as well. So I actually get the patients to use where possible preservative free steroid for every hour by day after the surgery. And I cut down to every two hours for the first, um, you know, few weeks after surgery. So in those instances, I will cut that back to about four times a day early on. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, uh, Dr. Mita, um, you know, there's always the risk that any complication like this can affect the future longevity of the bleb because it's very uh, easy to go the other way where you reduce the steroids and then quickly you'll find that the patient goes the other way and the and the bleb starts to fibrose down very quickly and so the tip there is that you when you cut these steroids down you really want to watch these patients um you know relatively closely if you think that they are having an active bleb leak in the first instance you know i'll see them maybe in two days time uh, and then before i'm more confident in, in stretching them out but, but I guess the, the lesson there is really try and avoid a bleb leak in the first instance. So, so when, when people are operating with me, it's, it's all about meticulous closure. And, and sometimes you want to put fluorazine on the table um, so that you, you know that the, um, the bleb is going to be nice and, and, and stable afterwards. Dr. Jeffrey, you, you, you'd rather taper the, I mean, modify the dosage. How about changing it to some milder steroids or maybe non-steroid? Drops. Yeah, I, I I don't tend to switch to to non steroidals or anything like that. I, I will keep the um, the you know typically you know we use Maxidex, um, you know or um, I'll keep that going uh, because you know the fear is that especially if I cut the steroids down altogether, you know that any time from day five and day seven, you know there's going to be really high cytokine environment. There's going to be lots of uh, recruited my, you know, activated uh, tenons and, and, and pro-inflammatory malayu. So, so, you know, I, I definitely, I, I mean, like in my hands, I don't know if you guys or, or if Prof Morgan or anyone would, would have something else to say, but I, I certainly don't stop the, mm -hmm. stop the steroid. That's dexamethasone, is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, the second question is from Dr. Regina. She, um, ask whether um, how early a follow-up procedure should be taken after bleb failure? Uh, okay, so how early follow-up procedure? So, so as early as you need to keep the patient's glaucoma stable, um, but the whole point, and hopefully the, the point of the, the talk tonight was that when you see the, the patients, actively think about the fibrosis that's happening with the bleb underneath. Um, and so if you identify that there are any early signs of bleb failure, so things like increased uh, vascularity, um, you know, if, if the bleb's looking hot or red, that's when you really want to intervene. So in terms of how early, um, you know, it depends on how, you know, what stage you are after the surgery as well. You know, if it's early on, you know, you can try your bleb massage. If you've got releasables, pull out the releasables. Um, releasables themselves, it depends on how many you put in. I typically put in two, so I, I tend to like to uh, wait at least a week before I start pulling out releasables, uh, and ideally more at two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess in answer to that question, um, it's, it's as early as you need to, and hopefully um, you identify blood failure and manage it before it becomes a real problem. And when do you do... Uh... Inter uh, interventions like uh, needling? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess there needs to be a distinction between needling and so that's where you're actually, you know, really sticking a needle in, cutting away scar tissue and trying to lift up any flap, um, scleral flap that's associated with your, um, that might be fibrosed um, versus just putting in um, five fluorouracil or doing injections like that. So in terms of five FU, I, I in clinic typically use a combination of five fluorouracil 
um, and I use a five milligram injection in combination with uh, dexamethasone, um, four mil 0 0.4 milligrams. So 0 0.1 mils of each to make 0 0.2 mils. And, and, and I'll even anytime, anytime. So typically at week one, if if it's a really angry looking bleb, I, I, I can actually start my post-operative injections. And if you if you track back to the five fluorouracil studies um, of old, when they were originally using 5-FU to, to modulate uh, bleb fibrosis, I mean, these guys were doing it twice a day, you know, for seven days straight. <laughs> You know, so so so, you know, there's, you know, you've got to watch about watch out for avascularity afterwards. But generally, it's it's pretty good, and you want to get in there. And uh, really, the only thing that I worry about is the corneal epithelium because the five fu can really hit the uh, cornea quite hard, especially when you're using it frequently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. 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 On to the next question, uh, Doctor Ariani. Uh, is asking, um, yeah, early needling would be better than any medication like rokinase inhibitor regarding fibrosis after trabeculectomy. So needling versus medication. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, another good question. Um, another good question. So in this instance, you've done a glaucoma surgery, you've done a trabeculectomy, and then you're seeing that the bleb's starting to be quite low. There's fibrosis, and you think it's fibrosis at the flat margin. Um, so, you know, early needling versus medication, I'll be honest, I like to give, I mean, and I guess it um, tracks back to the previous question, but, but realistically, I, I want to avoid reoperating if I can. So in those instances, I'll typically uh, restart the patient on something like Timolol, um, just to, you know, reduce the aqueous um, or suppress the aqueous production. Um, and and um, in those instances, I'll, I'll typically see you know what pressure I can get them down to with the combination of of the uh, of the blib and um, and just some drops. Um, I, I guess if you think that there's blib fibro like fibrosis at the flat margin, then yes, I, I won't be afraid to go back in for an early needling just to see if I can catch and lift that blib flap and and that in itself. Um, but once again, it depends on the patient in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be honest, we, we don't have access to rogue kinase inhibitors um, in, in Australia yet. Um, so, you know, Timolol is certainly my go-to. You would give Timolol instead? Yeah, I, I tend to give Timolol early. I tend to avoid a prostaglandin um, in those early instances, because once again, there's the concept of, of prostaglandins being pro-inflammatory. So mm -hmm. I, I do like to avoid that if I can in the early post-operative phase. Post-operative yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Maybe next question from Dr. Siska. I read that cataract surgery after trabeculectomy increases the risk of trap failure. Uh, what is your opinion? When is the perfect timing of cataract surgery after trabeculectomy? Yeah, so I think Dr. Irma has looked into this, um, so she can probably respond, uh, but I'm happy to chip in as well. You would like to say something about this question. So when is the perfect timing of cataract surgery after trabeculectomy? Mm, um, thank you, Dr. Siska. I mean, uh, uh, in, our, in our institutions or in our centers, usually we will perform the cataract surgery um, minimum in um, three months after the uh, trabeculectomy surgery. If the conditions of uh, the blab was good, and also uh, the uh, the the cataract uh, uh, the the cataracts uh, the uh, the progress cataract was uh, very real, and uh, that that if that affect the visual acuity, and but the recent journal that I have read, uh, the cataract surgery um, after trabeculate to me uh, usually perform minimum on six months until uh, a year after the for, uh, the, the surgery uh, maybe the, any any uh, the doctor will add my my uh, add the your experience about this thank you yeah yeah, exactly. So, so uh, absolutely, Siska, that's a really good point. Um, 
Absolutely. Uh, either doing a phaco trabeculectomy tends to worse uh, end in kind of less favorable outcomes. And certainly doing cataract surgery after trabeculectomy increases the risk of failure. Yeah. yeah. So we, we tend to see pressures go up. And, and the reason for that is because once again, cataract surgery will be pro-inflammatory. And remember the aqueous humor that drains, you know, with that chamber is going straight out and that fluid's going straight to your blib. Okay, mm -hmm. so so what I tell the registrars is that once the patient's had a trab, they're having cataract surgery, you've got to treat them like they've just had a trabeculectomy again. Okay, so postoperatively, these patients need more frequent steroid um, installation than what you'd routinely do after cataract surgery. Um, you know, I've looked into the evidence of whether or not it's worth doing 5-FU injections at the same time of cataract surgery. Some glaucoma surgeons do do that um, at the end of cataract surgery. I personally don't, but I'll, I'll watch them like a hawk after um, cataract surgery um, in conjunction with a in conjunction with a trabeculectomy. And in terms of the timing of the cataract surgery after trabeculectomy, um, as Irma as Dr. Irma mentioned, um, most people we we like to wait between six to twelve months because the evidence shows that if you're going to do your cataract surgery any sooner than then. Um, it tends to in result in increased risk of trabeculectomy failure. So you want to settle the inflammation down path to the trab, let it really settle before you proceed to the next thing. Mm -hmm. In our institution, we are, um, uh, I think the, the health system, the, the uh, national insurance system doesn't allow us to do combination surgery. So nowadays we uh, don't do combination anymore. We do... No. A stepwise, I mean, one surgery and then the other. So yeah, but if uh, I think it's also a good consideration to for the longevity of the blep, yeah, mm -hmm. Dr. Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we know that doing combined surgery does have a higher risk of failure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. One more question. Is this okay? I know it's probably rather late at your. Uh, That's okay. I've got all. We've got all night. Okay, Dr. Dea, Rai, Dea wants to ask, um, I guess this is a question of when to do second trabeculectomy or glaucoma device, drainage device in, in cases of blep failure. Sure. So uh, another good question, but uh, really the answer depends on why you think the trabeculectomy failed in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you know, you, you've got to go back and you've got to think about, you know, what you did, what you did differently and, and what you do differently. Because if you're going to do a second trabeculectomy, um, you know, you've got to see and make sure that you're not missing something that's going to make it fail straight away again. And, and you know that doing second surgery is going to result in faster failure. Okay, because the conjunctiva has already been primed from failing and fibrosis in the first one. Um, in answer to that question, in terms of what I consider, it depends on how much real estate you've got left. Okay. So I do a lot of my glaucoma surgeries supranasally in the first instance. And that means that I can move superiorly, um, you know, for my trabeculectomy if I need to do a second surgery. And then I reserve supratemporal for a tube if it's required down the track. So, so once again, I guess the question um, can be answered depending on the patient in front of you. Okay. Because you've got to think about what's best for your patient. OK, now, if you think that the patient is at high risk of failure for any reason, then typically you will go for a glaucoma drainage device as a second step. OK, or even cyclodiode if 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 things are end stage. Yeah. So I guess in answer to that question, um, yes, you can consider a second trabeculectomy, but I'd encourage you to think about why your first one failed in the first place. And, and GDD is a good second step. Would you also consider uh, for the other eye, should they, if you feel like the other eye might need uh, glaucoma surgery also in the future, and the first eye that you did trap failed quite uh, early, uh, yeah. postoperatively, would you consider like a primary tube or something? Yeah, other? I, I would consider a primary tube, but to be honest, I'd still use trabeculectomy as my go-to. So I'd probably start with a trabeculectomy, but know that I have to watch the patient much more frequently. And I'd also be, be much more willing to, um, you know, intervene early with my five or few decks or other, other ways to modify that, that surgery. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, maybe one last question. This is from Dr. Nabila. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, in post-trap patient, pseudophagic with posterior capsule opacity, is there any minimal time distance between the trap to the laser for the posterior capsulotomy, since the laser will also induce inflammation? What's your take on that, Dr. Jeffrey? Yeah, well, <laughs> if I see a patient who's pseudophagic with PCO, I'd probably address that before the trabeculectomy because that's probably the best thing that's going to be uh, there for their visual rehabilitation because you, you want to give the patient, you know, the best chance of, of seeing um, throughout that phase. Um, but, but yes, it will be pro-inflammatory. Uh, we know that even after something gentle like PCO, there, there is increased inflammation in the AC. And so once again, I, I tend to wait three months. Mm, three months, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, is there any more question? Anybody wants to open mic? Other than, um, maybe Dr. Firna or Prof. Morgan would like to say something about our discussion. Any, any, any comments? Uh, no, it was very interesting. Thank you. It was, uh, it was, it was a fun evening, and it was great to hear the con the discussion. There's, I guess, there's, I, there's ne every trabeculectomy is different. Uh, there's not a, a a set answer, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, very, think, very yeah. customized. I mean, we have to see it case by case. Uh, there are so many uh, uh, possibilities in one case. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Firna, please. Yes, I want to. I want to only say that uh, even sometimes I found that although the blood morphology is not as good as we thought, but it is functioning. So <laughs> sometimes I <laughs> didn't know. Even even when we think that the blab is not that good, but mm -hmm. it is working. Mm -hmm. well, I think I, yeah, I think I think props actually uh, looked at this and described this as well. Yeah. Um, but, but there was a theory that sometimes if there's no blab there, you can actually. You know, we know that conjunctival lymphatics do exist. Yeah. And so there are these instances where you can actually get into a pocket of lymphatic and presumably that's doing a lot of the, the drainage uh, mm -hmm. on, on a basis where you, you can't necessarily see it. Um, I, I don't know, Prof, if you've got any comments to add to that. It could be to see the lymphatics or, or any, any uh, test that we can do to see yeah. whether this is the lymphatics working. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a complicated thing. We did a published a study some years ago looking at the area of trabeculectomy bleb drainage because you can inject vision blue into the anterior chamber and then it'll go into the bleb and outline the area. And also, if the lymphatics then connect to the lymphatics. So there tended to be more lymphatics connecting to larger, more diffuse, not elevated, but more diffuse bleb. So I, I personally think that diffuse, as in bleb surface area, is is important. Bleb morphology. I suspect we poison lymphatics with mitomycin C. I think mitomycin C is very much a double-edged sword. Mm. Uh, I try not to use too much, and I put it quite posterior, but it is it's a very much a double-edged sword actually. Mitomycin C. Um, I mean, you could. There's so many f things one can talk about with trabeculectomy. Uh, yeah, I think, but I, 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 it warrants, I think, many more of these types of discussions. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yes, I enjoy the discussion, actually. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone. We had a good, uh, good evening uh, discussing all the important stuff in our glaucoma practice. So uh, as a, before we say goodbye, can we take a picture, maybe group picture? Um, Dr. Joffrey, you, want, you might want to unshare the screen or is it Dr. Irma? Thank you. Dr. Yeah. Mick, can you help us um, picture? Uh, yes, of course, Dr. Mika. Uh, Dr. Uh, everyone yeah. can, if possible, turn on their camera. Dr. Mickey, if everybody is quite ready, maybe you can count before the snapshot. 
Okay, I think I'll start counting now, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone, I will take the picture. One, two, three. For second page, one, two, three. Third page, one, two, three. Fourth page, one, two, three. Fifth page, one, two, three. And last page, one, two, three. Uh, that will be all, Dr. Pia, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. I, have, I hope everyone had a good evening and I have a, um, something uh, that's useful in our practice and hope to see you again in our next lecture series. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you.